Well, it's been a long time in coming, but <coughs> I said I'd um, finish the study on the tabernacle. Um, and for those of you who weren't here, uh, some five months ago or six months ago, you better get the tapes, otherwise you just won't know what went before. And what went before was quite important, and you must see it in the relation of the whole. And I wish to continue now with that series. In the scriptures, there is a lot spoken about the tabernacle of God, and there is a lot taught about it, and very few Christians ever bother to read the Old Testament. They see there's all the ideas of why there were curtains, why there were uh, an inner tent, why there were boards, why there were sockets for the foundation, why there was a brazen altar, why there was a laver. And most Christians don't even have a clue what it signifies. But the whole of the tabernacle was prophetic. It expressed what would come in the salvation of God. And we shared uh, throughout the scriptures um, on, we've already done, if you remember, the coverings and the outer fence and the pins and the cords and the boards and the sockets and uh, the veil, the rent veil and the unrent veil. And then we went through the gates, if you remember the outer gate with the four pillars and the inner gate with the five pillars and what they were and what the significance of them was. Um, and uh, we went through to the point where we came to the furniture. Now, if you have a pencil and paper, you'd do well to write down. Um, it's good to have a pencil and paper or a pen because there are a lot of scriptures that it would be good for you to look up afterwards. And I want to come tonight to the probably the most important area of misunderstanding. And if you just uh, look, we have a little diagram of the tabernacle there. And this was, if you'd stood on a hill, this is how you would have seen it. Uh, um, you'd have seen it with the outer perimeter fence, which was held up, which, which protected the court. Now, no one could come to the court except they came through the entrance here. And who remembers what the four pillars stood for? Okay, when I go on next, um, I'm going on to the labor next week, I'm going to ask you the same question. You better look it up. You should remember. Hmm? Sorry? Thank you very much. And it also, son of, yeah, go on. Okay, well, you look it up, and I'll ask you next time, all right? Got to, got to get you going back on your notes. You should remember these things. Okay, but there was no way in to the tabernacle. Now, here was the brazen altar. The brazen altar should be actually slightly nearer to the entrance. And then the laver should be slightly nearer the um, tabernacle itself. This is the court. Now the tabernacle was an oblong box, and in there was the Holy of Holies and the holy place which only the priest went in. Now I do want to point out to you that uh, there was no way, no way of coming into the court without coming face to face with the brazen altar. You just couldn't come in unless you came face to face with the brazen altar. And God designed it that way on purpose. It's interesting to note that there are seven pieces of furniture within the tabernacle 
And seven is the number of completion. And the seventh is the ark of God. Whoops. Is the ark of God. And so as we go on, we're going to go through the different furniture and significance of them uh, for the Christian and what it means because it, you need to know what it means. Now God, when he designed this, he said to Moses, he said, see that you make it according to the pattern which I showed you in the mountain. So don't you make it any differently. And Paul, when he records it, he says, look, the tabernacle reveals the things that are in heaven. It reveals the order of them. So if you want to know how the heavenly operate and the spirituals operate, you need to study the tabernacle. Of course, you could study it in the nice brethren formalistic idea and get bored to death. That isn't the way to study it. It must be life. And it is life. And so we're going on. And if you'll turn with me to Exodus, chapter 27, you should find it after Genesis if you have a proper Bible. In Exodus chapter 27, verse 1, we read these words. And thou shalt make an altar of shittim wood, five cubits long and five cubits broad, and the altar shall be four square. And the height thereof shall be three cubits, and thou shalt make the horns of it upon the four corners thereof, his horn shall be of the same, and thou shalt overlay it with brass. And thou shalt make his pans to receive his ashes, and his shovels, and his basins, and his flesh hooks, and his fire pans. All the vessels thereof thou shalt make of brass. And thou shalt make it, your, thou shalt make for it a grate of network of brass. And upon the net, shalt thou make four brazen rings in the four corners thereof and thou shalt put it under the compass of the altar beneath that the net may be even to the midst of the altar now I do want to point out here uh, something that is often mistaken um, and unfortunately I didn't look carefully enough at the slides when we prepared them, which is my fault, not George's. George did what I asked him. Um, but uh, it is not a net to catch um, and a grill to catch the ashes in. Please note that, or to set the fire upon. It was a grill um, and a net that came up in the midst of the altar, um, but it was basically to hold the pans and the pots, and it went round. It was a cage, and it was to go on the outside, not on the inside of the altar, because God forbade that anything used with hands should ever have sacrifice laid upon it, anything made with man's hands. Do you remember when he spoke to Abraham and when he spoke about building the altar? Now, very often, uh, people will portray it, and unfortunately... Um, we have a bit, I think, uh, portrayed it as uh, a, a grid. But the grid is on the outside, and it protected it from the animals, and it protected it from the things that got a bit wild. You know, no animal likes its throat cut. Um, but that was what used to happen. And then the animal was tied onto the horns of the altar. Um, and thou shalt make, verse 6, and thou shalt make staves for the altar, staves of shit and wood, and overlay them with brass. And the stave shall be put into the rings, and the stave shall be on the two sides of the altar to bear it. Now I want you to note that the four brazen rings in the four corners thereof were on the network of brass. Now if the brass was within, it would be very difficult to put the staves in the... Do you follow what I'm saying? You couldn't put the staves in a network if the network was inside because the staves would have a little problem going round bends, like most people. And the staves shall be put into the rings and the staves shall be upon the two sides of the altar to bear it. Hollow with boards shall thou make it 
and it was show, as it was showed thee in the mount, so shall they make it. Now Moses, this wasn't all the instruction Moses had, because God said, as you were shown, well obviously if he'd been shown it, then he communicated what he'd been shown to the people that made it. But here we get the basic measurements and the basic tenet of it, we don't get every detail of it. It doesn't say how the basins were to be made, but everything was shown Moses in the Mount of God, and for a very specific reason. Now, if you flick on with me to chapter 30, verse 28, you will discover Uh, verse 28, it, it refers to it as, and the altar of burnt offering with all his vessels. Now the brazen altar was the altar of burnt offering. All right? It was where the burnt offering was. Now, many people get confused. They, they read burnt offering and they read brazen altar and they refer to one and the same thing. All right? So where we talk about uh, the burnt offerings that were offered to the Lord, or where we talk about the brazen altar, we are discussing one and the same thing. Everyone clear on that? Are you all right, Bernard? Yeah? Got that down. Um, now, the other thing is, if you go with me to chapter 40, chapter 40, verse 29, And you read this. And he put the altar of the burnt offering, that's the brazen altar, you remember, uh, by the door of the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation and offered upon it the burnt offering and the meat offering as the Lord commanded Moses. And you will see where the place of it was. We've now established what it was and now we're talking about the place where it was. All right, it was at the door. Now, it was put at the door for a specific reason. That was, there was no way into the tabernacle of the congregation but by the brazen altar or the altar of burnt offering. And um, what I want to now show you is the place that it has or the significance that it has in the Christian life. If you turn with me to Leviticus, which is not much further on and chapter 1 verse 9 but is inwards and his legs shall he wash in water, and the priest shall burn all on the altar to be a burnt, offer, a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet savour unto the Lord. Now we're talking about a bullock, and then we talk about a sheep, all right? And it's the flaying of the animals. Obviously, uh, they didn't just stick a whole carcass up there. Um, I'm coming on to the different types of sacrifice at another time. I just want to deal with the altar at the moment. But you will notice about the uh, offering that it says that it was um, an offering made by fire, a burnt sacrifice, a sweet savour unto the Lord. And um, that word sweet savour unto the Lord, you will remember it reoccurs in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 2. Or you might not remember, but it does. And it reads, you needn't turn to it, Christ has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savour. And the whole of the purpose of this altar was declaring the atonement of Christ to come. The animals that were offered were a sweet savour unto God, but the sweet savour that was to come was Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. And this altar is the 
um, portrayal of the cross of Jesus Christ at Calvary. And the whole purpose of it was a dealing with sin. When people came along to offer a sacrifice, they came to confess their sin, lay their hand on the animal to identify themselves with it, confess their sin, the animal's throat was split, was slit, it was then flayed, it was placed upon the altar, and it was burnt. Now it was burnt as a sacrifice to God to make atonement, but death had to happen, and that death was a substitute for the individual. And he was forgiven his sin. Ceremonially, he was forgiven his sin when he made that confession. Now no one could ever come into the tabernacle of the, or the tent of the congregation until there had been an atonement for sin. And blood had to be shed. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. So the scripture says. So the whole thing was an exercise where people dealt with sin. Now they knew that if they sinned and there was no atonement made for their sin, then if they died, there was only Gehenna, hell, left for them. In other words, they knew that God had passed the sentence of death on every individual. And this was a solemn reminder to them. Every time a man sinned, they'd see him take one of the unblemished sheep from his flock and he would walk through the camp to that tabernacle door and the priest would meet him there and he'd lay his hand upon the animal. He would confess his sin and he would watch the life drain out of that animal as the blood spilled upon the floor. And then he would watch the animal cut up and burn. And he knew then that God forgave his sin. And once a year there was the Day of Atonement where the priest then, the Levitical priest, as says in Hebrews, atoned for his sins and the sins of all the people. And he took, if you remember, once a year the blood and sprinkled it upon the mercy seat. But I don't want to go into that here. We're coming on to that on number seven, which is the Ark of the covenant and the mercy seat but here we have the uh, the portrayal of sin being dealt with by the shedding of blood Christ is the antitype of this I mean the brazen altar is the antitype of this and um, Moses was shown it and when he saw it he began to understand and I want you to notice something here that Moses built all this and they functioned in it and they believed in it all but there was one thing that was essential and that was the high priestly office once a year had to take blood into the Holy of Holies and had to sprinkle it upon the mercy seat because the mercy seat was above the law and God was upon the mercy seat and the law was beneath the mercy seat and therefore the blood of sprinkling showed there was a purging of the breaking of the law once a year. All right, the great day of atonement. And the Jews still celebrate the great day of atonement. Thank God that we don't have to because Jesus Christ, when he came and he died on Calvary's cross, he atoned once for all. And it's done. There is a sacrifice with full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice was made by Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. I do want to point out that um, when Christ died on Calvary, he was not a priest. He did not enter into his priestly office until he ascended to Father in heaven. Because the Aaronic priesthood was the priesthood of the earth and that is that which functions in the mosaic tabernacle and therefore it is blasphemy it is anti-god it is evil for any man to set himself up as a priest and to offer sacrifice once again of Christ now the catholic church 
Every time they take Mass, they re-sacrifice the Lord Jesus Christ in their uh, mystical religious ceremonies. And they offer the blood of Christ and they claim transubstantiation for the elements. And may I say that there is no such thing as a priesthood of God. It's blasphemy. And it's evil. And any man that does such a thing will indeed in that day find the wrath of God. I do want to be plain about that. When you come to deal with the things of God, God doesn't play games. And when he set this order up, it was for the Mosaic priesthood. There is now the order of Melchizedek. That is not an earthly priesthood, it's a heavenly one. The sacrifice was made once for all by Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross, and there's no sense at all in which any man can re-offer the sacrifice of Christ. Please understand that. And therefore, all those religious ceremonies are blasphemous. In fact, one must remember that the one sin that won't be forgiven is blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. That is what God says in his word. I just happen to believe it. Therefore, I know that if anyone wants to put a foot in two camps, he will find that one camp is the devils where they sacrifice unto idols and one is God's. And he will find that light and darkness don't dwell together. That is why it is totally and utterly erroneous ever to encourage someone to stay in an evil religion that is a mockery to the truth of the word of God. That I believe and I make no apology for and if you don't agree with it, well, God bless you, find another church. Because we do believe that. I believe it's 100% what God says and that's it. I don't apologize for it and I won't compromise. Furthermore, I'm prepared to die for it. And I trust you are too. Many martyrs, the covenanters, in Scotland I went to a place where 70,000 of them were slain in a fortnight. They died to bear forth this truth to this country. I believe in truth. And I believe that the word of God reveals the truth. And we must be 100% for the truth and stand with the truth. If other people want to go another way, that's up to them. But we're not. We're uncompromising in what we believe and know. We're not ashamed of it. We're not ashamed of the cross of Christ. And if people don't like it, as I say to them, this isn't the church to stay in. People don't like being the type of people who are going to stand up and be counted. Well, God bless you, go somewhere else. Because there's going to come a day when we're all going to be counted. And in that day, I want to know that we've been found faithful, don't you? That we've separated ourselves from the evil and the false religion. And separation is a very necessary part of the gospel called sanctification, being set apart unto God. We're coming on to that. But I'm just stating now that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ came and the altar sacrifice was dealt with once for all. Jesus never will suffer again. I've heard people pray in meetings and say, Lord, how much I make you suffer. You know, when I sin, I want to tell you that is a lie of the devil. Have you ever heard people pray that? I know how much it's hurting you, Lord, when I do this and when I do that, and how much it causes you to suffer. It doesn't cause God to suffer at all. Jesus Christ made his sacrifice in that day and when he died and he cried on Calvary's cross, it is finished. It was. Full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice. Alright? So sinning does not cause Christ to suffer. Do 
Do you understand? Doesn't please him. What I'm saying is it doesn't cause him to suffer. Have I made myself clear? Don't ever get into the habit of thinking that God's suffering because you sin. You're going to suffer, not him. Haven't you discovered that yet? <laughs> You're the ones who get the suffering when you sin, not him. And we've got to come off. You see, we get into a habit of speech and it becomes a habit of thought if we're not careful. And I've often heard people pray and I thought, not so, Lord, little liar. Um, it's not true. Christ made one sacrifice forever. Isn't that wonderful? It's done. But let's get back to the brazen altar. This was the antitype foreshadowing that which was to come. And all the time they look forward in faith. And of course, you, if you go on with me, um, you will notice that with the sacrifice there, that men had to come and they had to take the sheep that was without blemish, didn't they? From their flock, it had to be a... Uh, a yearling and they took it along to the priest now that, that sheep had to be without spot or blemish they took it along there and then they watched its throat slit and the life drain out now let me make it very plain that men had to do that they had to bring it there and they had to lay their hands on its head to confess their sin. In the same way, Jesus Christ was taken by men. He was taken out to Calvary and he was nailed up by men. And yet, it was a sacrifice that God was well pleased with. But man had a lot to do with it. It was by the hands of men that he was nailed to the tree. And even though it was by the hands of men, yet it was in the plan, the purposes, and the foreknowledge of God that Christ suffered. And even though men came and they bought lambs and sheep and bullocks to be sacrificed there, it was always in the purposes of God. Though they did it, it was God's purpose. Understand it and understand it well. If you look in Acts chapter 2, verse 23. See, I hear so much today talked about the fact that it's all of grace. You know, it's all of God, nothing of us. But there's a lot that we have to do when we deal with salvation. Now, I can't die for myself. Jesus died for me. I can't atone for my sin. He atoned for me. But there's a lot that I've got to do in order to make that atonement efficacious for me. That means apply to me. There's a lot that I've got to do. It's no good me sitting back and saying, well, thank you, Jesus, it's all done. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Isn't that wonderful? All done in Jesus. Now, what he said was untrue. Because he was presenting forth a gospel with no responsibility for the individual. Now I had responsibilities when I came to Christ. Now, uh, yes, I couldn't atone for myself. Yes, I couldn't bring myself into communion with God. But my responsibility is to come to the cross and to the Lamb and to see the atonement made for my sin and see the cleansing away dealt with at the cross. Now the Jews knew it because each time they sinned, they had to come to the brazen altar. Now each time I sin or go out of the way of God, I've got to come to the cross of Jesus Christ and be cleansed. Now I cannot go into the presence of God and I cannot know communion with God unless I've been at that cross. They couldn't go into the tabernacle, but via the brazen altar, I can't go into the presence of God. And if you remember, the presence of God is here, in there. There was no way in but through there. They had to come that way. And if you want to come into the presence of God, 
You cannot come into the presence of God unless you come via the brazen altar which speaks of the cross of Jesus Christ and his atonement and death. There is no way in. Now, understand it and understand it well. Now, if you had entered into priestly office, which you haven't, let me assure you, but if you had, it might be a slightly different story. But I'm not going into that at present. I'm just talking about the leper who's cleansed. Remember the story? How many times was the leper cleansed? That's right, sevenfold cleansing. And then you see, at that point, he comes to the brazen altar. You say, but goodness me, hasn't he had enough? No. It's then that begins to come the atonement and the shedding of blood and the realization. A lot of cleansings go up to that. Now, every time I fall, I've got to come back there. And I cannot have communion with God unless I do. Now, many, many Christians lose out in this respect that once they've had initial experience of forgiveness of sins, they believe that they are forgiven and they cease to walk in the light of the cross. And they think that they've gone beyond it. I meet many, many people who have an idea that repentance is a thing that they did before they became a Christian, but now it's not necessary. Repentance is an attitude of heart and an attitude of life which is continuous right throughout your Christian experience. If it isn't, then you've walked out of the way. If you really believe that you've got anywhere, I want to tell you you're deceived, you're deceiving your own heart, and you're deceiving the people that you say such things to. Because always we depend on the blood of Jesus Christ and on the cross of Calvary for everything. There is no cleansing, there is no dealing with God, and there is no way into God but via that cross. You understand me? I wonder if you really do. Many nod their heads. I wonder how many really understand what I'm saying. Would to God he would open your inward ears to hear. Acts chapter 2, verse 23. Him, that's Christ, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Now who did it? The Jews did it. But they did it by the foreknowledge and it was predetermined by God that that's what they'd do. You see, they didn't catch Jesus out. It wasn't Satan's greatest hour. It was Satan's stupidity. God had planned it before the foundation of the world. That's why if you turn to Revelation 5.5, 5, you'll find the words there, that behold the Lamb of God that was slain. I saw in the midst of the throne the Lamb of God, as it were, slain before the foundation of the world, as you remember. Now, he, he is the Lamb of God, slain. In the predeterminate counsel of God, it happened before the foundation of the world. Now it happened to work out that Christ came down, walked upon the earth, and on the 33rd year, as some would have it, he laid down his life and he was crucified. Third day he rose again from the dead, didn't he? Now God planned it all out in eternity, long before the earth ever was, long before you and I were a twinkle in our Father's eye. God had it all planned out. God knew, and God predetermined it. And it wasn't by chance, and yet God used man to deal the deathly blow, and yet he didn't. 
Pilate turned around and said, Don't you know I've got power? Jesus just looks at him and said, You wouldn't have any power unless it was given you from above. Wonder what Pilate thought about that. <laughs> you know, he thought he was kind of the man. Jesus just put him in his place. But he didn't argue about, you know, false accusers came, they accused him of this, they accused him of that. He just kept quiet. Answer me! Jesus didn't, he answered not a word. And he was led, as it said, as a lamb to the slaughter. Yet he opened not his mouth. Now, of course, the lamb foretold the lamb of God. And you'll remember if you turn to 1 John chapter 1, uh, sorry, John chapter 1, I think it's verse, um, let me see, verse 12. He was foretold, was he not? As, um, Verse 12 uh, says this. Uh, it says, um, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even them to believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but... How? Of God. Now, I want you to notice that it's not your will that brings about birth. And John's testimony was this in verse 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Now, he pointed to Christ as the Lamb that was coming. Now, you'll remember Abraham in the mountain or maybe you won't remember, but I will now tell you, on Mount Moriah, when Abraham was going to offer up Isaac, do you remember when he was going with a mule and the sun and, and uh, the wood? Isaac said to him, Father, he says, where's the offering? And Abraham turned to him and said, Son, he said, the Lord shall provide himself a lamb. And you'll remember then when he laid Isaac on the altar and the angel cried from heaven and said, Stop, and he didn't slay his son. Then he found a ram there caught in the thicket God had provided. Do you remember that? And Isaac was received back as though it were from the dead. Hebrews tells us that. And so God provided a lamb, and here was the lamb coming, and this lamb was to be the fulfillment of every sacrifice ever offered upon that altar. And I want to tell you that if it weren't for the fact that Jesus came and died, those sacrifices would not have been fulfilled because they all looked forward to his coming. They were efficacious because he came. That is where forgiveness was bought. It was in the Son, a perfect life lived. Now it was foretold in the fact that the lamb had to be without spot or blemish and Jesus was without sin. But it all looked forward to his great sacrifice in that day when he would lay down his life, the only begotten of God. And if you turn with me to Revelation chapter 5. Verse 6 says, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Now you remember, Jesus was foretold as the Lamb of God, and here it speaks of Jesus, the Lamb. But I want you to notice about the Lamb that it was standing as it had been slain. It wasn't still dead, it was alive. And it also depicts it 
Um, in verse 5 of that same prophetic utterance, it says, And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Now, there is depicted as the lion of the tribe of Judah, it's depicted as the um, root of David, and when he looks, he sees a lamb as it were slain. Enough to blow your mind, isn't it? First is one thing, then is another thing, then he sees him as something else. And yet he's the Christ. In other words, he saw the different manifestations of the Son of God. He is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the Lamb. He's the Root of David. He's all those things. And we must always remember that um, when he appears in his manifestation as you have the uh, different names for God which sometime we'll do a study on um, God will manifest himself in the Hebrew you'll find there are seven names and each name has a different meaning which shows a different aspect to the personality of God or one of the seven spirits if you wish to put it that way though let me be clear I'm not saying there are seven gods seven manifestations of the spirit of God it's rather like the sun. The sun's in the sky. I'm sure you've all heard the example. The sun's in the sky and it gives forth light, doesn't it? But it also gives forth heat. And it also gives forth radiation. Now, radiation isn't heat and heat isn't light. And none of them are the sun. But they all are of the sun. They're just different manifestations. Now, to take one without the others makes it not the Son any longer because the Son gives us all three. And in the same way, we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. Now, he's revealed in three ways. And that's the way it is. And so we have the sevenfold revelation of God and of his Son because they're one. Therefore, they'll both have sevenfold revelation as will the Spirit of God. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, you notice it says seven eyes, seven spirits of God. How about that? There we are. And it's all written in a mystery. So those that know, know, and those that don't, don't. And isn't that good? And you'll notice that it was the resurrected lamb in verse 5 it, in verse 6 is the lamb who was standing it wasn't the lamb, lamb laying down and so many people when they picture this when they read it in Revelation they picture a kind of lamb that's dead but it's not a dead lamb it's a live lamb because dead lambs don't stand do they alright it says it was standing Look, in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain. It wasn't still, still slain, but it had been. Do you understand? Revelation, a manifestation of the resurrection. All right? So the lamb's no longer dead. Glory to God. Wouldn't like you to think or imagine in your mind's eye a lamb that's dead. A lot of people do. Now you'll notice that you can't get in to the tabernacle but by the, by the brazen altar. And Jesus was the lamb. And I want to tell you that you can't get into heaven. And you can't move into the heavenly or spirit realm but by the altar, the cross of Calvary and the lamb upon the altar, Jesus Christ. There is no way in to God except through Calvary. There is no way into the spirit realm except via confession and atonement. That's why I, I fear for people if they say to me, but I've always been a good person. A man has a wicked, evil, unregenerate heart full of darkness, full of bitterness and hatred full of envy, jealousy, 
pride, arrogance. You all know what I'm talking about, don't you? Your heart and mine, when it's unregenerate. That's the way we are. It's called human nature. You've all got one, haven't you? That's why Paul could say, I'm the chief of sinners. You see? Uh, sinners of whom I am chief, he said. Now he felt that. And anyone that's really come to a deep dealing with God will always feel that there's no one as bad as they are. And if you haven't got there, then really you haven't even begun. You've never come near the brazen altar and you're on your way to hell. You realize the dealings of God in your life and you know the wickedness and the evil of your own heart. And you know how you can't trust any thought of yours. You can't trust any virtue of yours. Because it comes from a wicked, unregenerate self-nature. Ego-inflating self. Evil. And that totally prevents you ever from getting anywhere with God. And unless you come by that brazen altar and the cross of Jesus Christ, you'll go to hell with it. There isn't a way in. And God's wrath and judgment is still upon your head. Say, well, well, well I'm, I'm saved. Are you? Well, well I, I, I believe, did you? What did you believe? You see, so often we get forgiveness of sins. But the problem is, we don't see the evil of self. Now, what Christ came to deal with is our human nature. That repugnant, ugly, vile self-life. That's what he came to deal with. You and me. Say, so what? I, I'm not like that. Well, then you've never had conviction of sin. Oh, you might have had conviction of sins. But not conviction of sin. S-I-N realizing that everything you are is contrary to God. Now, people don't like that part of the gospel. And I find Christians who, you remember Jesus said, he that seeks to come any way but by the door is a thief and a robber. You remember when he talked about that in the sheepfold. Now, sheep have to come by there. Now it's not a nice place for sheep to go, is it? You hear the other sheep bleating, yeah, meh, and <coughs> as the blood drains out, and you think, I'm not going that way. Get me in another way. I mean, you don't make nice noises when your throat slips. I want to remember, you know, I, I, I got a film, I think I've probably told you, T.L. Osborne. But for those of you that I haven't told, I got this film of India. And I took it, you know, I hadn't seen it before, so I took it to these old people's home. I was showing it in the afternoon. And there it was, showing this India and showing the poverty and everything. And then they show one of the temple rites. And during this temple rite, there was this little black lamb black as pitch, led forward. And this priest came along with a big knife and he raised it up and I thought the camera would turn away. It didn't. He chopped off its head and the body stood there headless. I, I heard gasps all around the room. I stopped the film and turned on the lights to see if I'd lost any of my old ladies. <laughs> I thought one, one or two would have died at that. Oh, it was... I showed it in a school for kids and they wanted to see it three times. It was, you know, <laughs> just shows you, doesn't it? Little savages. And 
As you get educated, you learn not to like those things, don't you? You become all squeamish. As a little kid, my, sir, can we see that again? Anyway, the thing is, there you are, taken as a lamb. Taken as a lamb. And you see, no one wants to go that way. I mean, who wants to, no one wants to die. That's why Jesus said to people, he said, look, if you're not prepared to lose your life, for my sake, I lay it down for my sake. He says, you're going to lose it. But he that loses his life is going to keep it. But if you try and keep it, you're going to lose it. And yet we, as Christians, we do everything to avoid the brazen altar. We will go along and we will point out to Jesus that we're without spot or blemish. Thank you, Lord, for saving me and cleansing me from all my sin. And yet self is enthroned on the heart so big and the ego so big that it's obnoxious in God's nostrils. And we're saying thank you very much because we won't go via the altar and yet we'll seek to creep in and have fellowship with God. We won't go in the right way We'll go round the side and try climbing the fence. Oh yes, I want communion with God. I want the gifts of the Spirit, which are spoken of, you know, when you get in the tabernacle. I want power to heal. I want this, I want that. But you won't go via the brazen altar to have self dealt with. And that is why so many people come into the gifts of the Holy Ghost and go into disaster. Because they have never gone via the cross of Calvary. Let me tell you now, if you seek a ministry, if you're seeking to minister, or you're seeking a way of going into the ministry, there is a devilish spirit in you. Because you're seeking it for yourself. You've got to die. All self and ambition goes. Everything's dealt with at the cross. Jesus said, I come to do thy will, O God. In the volume of the book it's written on me. No self-will, no self-desire, no self-elevation, no ego. And if you haven't got that dealt with, you've never got to the brazen altar. And I don't know many people in this place that have got there. Let me be straight. I see many charading and mocking people who are coming and pretending. It's a brazen altar and man, woman, if you won't go through it, you can't have the blessing of God. You're deceiving yourself. You don't deceive anyone else. You see, God can't let human flesh have the real things of the Spirit. He didn't. They'll destroy you. Oh, you can mess about in gifts. You can mess about thinking you've got a ministry. You can blubber and preach an odd sermon. You can do lots of things. But if you haven't gone this way, really it's you that's doing it. Oh yeah, people who get saved. That's what's so deadly about it. Things will happen. And if you think I'm not speaking to you or it doesn't apply to you, I want to tell you I'm talking to you directly, no one else in this room. You. Each individual I'm speaking to you. It's applied to you. Don't think it applies to someone else. Don't let the devil turn you away by thinking, oh, that's so and so. No, it's not. It's you.
Don't think that that, that description just fits Mrs. So-and-so or I remember it's such and such a person. No, it's you I'm talking to. Look, if you won't come by this brazen altar, you don't get into the heavenly realm. You just can't. And you've got to keep going via that praise and altar. There's only one way into the spiritual, and that's via the cross of Christ. And you can't get a shortcut. And man, I'm telling you, there's no way into God but via that. That's why some of you are wondering why it is that you don't get revelation. I want to tell you, you're not even in the realm of the Spirit. Some of you are wondering why you don't get understanding. It's because you haven't come this way. Some of you are wondering why things aren't working. It's because of this. You see, if your sacrifice isn't accepted, it says of Cain, it's because sin lieth at the door. And do you know why sin lay at the door? Because Cain went and offered the produce of his own hands and his own efforts. And so many of us are offering our religious lives to God. The things we're doing, aren't we good, God? And we offer our egos to God. Abel went and he slew a lamb. He knew there had to be shedding of blood. Don't you understand? You're only robbing yourselves. There's no way into God. No way but this way. That's why in the tabernacle, the brazen altar was put right there to show people one way in. And it was depicting the heavenly realm. Now I might answer one or two of you why you're not getting very far. Maybe you might now realize it's because you really are just doing what you want to do. I spoke to a man recently and he told me that God had called him to the ministry. I heard afterwards that he said it was the most um, dramatic, I think, no he didn't, traumatic, 15 minutes of his life when he spoke to me. He went back to his chair shaking. I said to him, do you believe what your denomination teaches? He said, no. But he was going to take the ministry because that's what he wants. And I said, listen, man. I said, do you know what happened to Uzziah when he wasn't sanctified and consecrated to touch the ark of God? God slew him. And I said, you're in that state. He didn't like that. No wonder he went back white and shaking to his seat. But you don't you see we're not dealing with a game. We're dealing with the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. We're not dealing with something that you can just push your way in and pretend and God doesn't know. Do you see, God can see right into your heart. He tries the reins of your heart. He knows your motives. He knows how much you're pleasing yourself and how much your ego building. He knows what little kingdom you're planning for yourself. He knows that you've crowned yourself. He sees right through your religion. The way you hold your hand when you sing, your pious look. You praise the Lord that's not coming from anything but a smile that's teeth deep, as Ed would say. And that's true. And usually the teeth are false behind it too. The whole thing's a sham, don't you see, unless God does it. You say, well, I don't like this kind of gospel. Well, that's fine. God bless you, don't come back. I'm not ashamed of it. You see, the truth is, there just isn't a way into God but via the cross.
that's the truth and self has got to be dealt with now self means I me if people offend me or if I get upset with what they say do you know why I get upset with what they say because I is very much a lie if I find that this person seems to get on my nerves and that person, do you know what? It's because I is ruling. I don't like what so-and-so does, it's because I. And the altar is the cross. And the altar there shows God's judgment. What they saw was God's judgment of sin. Every time a Jew slew that lamb and saw it burn he knew what God thought about sin he watched a substitute for himself being frizzled on that altar it was telling him there's going to be the flames of eternal torment <laughs> hell was very real to someone that stood there in the heat of it and the sweat of it and the stench of it watching it burn and the flames engulf that flesh they knew that sin, well, you know, what God's idea of sin was. God was saying to them each time, look, that lamb is being burnt in your place. But if you don't get yourself right, you're going to be burnt there one day. And believe me, you think you kid, you kid other people and you kid yourself, but you'll fry if you won't repent and there's only one way they saw the bloodshed and they saw the fire of God and you know Jesus he poured out his blood on Calvary's cross didn't he do you remember the fire of God's wrath was poured out upon him he cried out with an agonizing cry first the first thing you do when there's a fire raging and that just proclaims the judgment of God now I want to go on and point out something about this altar it had two staves to it now two staves are very necessary in any altar you see because to carry the altar it was square four squares you all remember that said it was a four square altar now if you want to carry it you have to have a stave on each side don't you which speaks of balance doesn't it now if we come to the cross of Christ and we forever speak about the death of Christ then we're going to have a lack of balance aren't we because though he was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world he appears in heaven now as what as a lamb as it had been slain but he's standing so he's resurrected and so I need to see not only does that altar speak to me about death but it also speaks about the fact of life because I can go on through past the altar and I can go on to the laver which speaks of the cleansing of the word which we will come to next week which we're not coming to now but we'll come to that which was made of the mirrors and the mirrors always speak of the word of God but there we are um, there we have the altar now it had a balance of two staves and it's two parts of the gospel to bring the cross into anyone's life you need two things of the gospel and the two parts one is the proclamation of the death of Christ in other words if no one tells you that Jesus died upon the cross and why he died upon the cross there is no way that you're going to have forgiveness of sins Jesus became the atonement God said in the day that a man sins he shall surely die now that death was spiritual separation from God in other words he became the light of God went out of his spirit death rule alright now when Jesus came and lived a perfect life and was crucified on Calvary's cross he took your death that means the darkness in you out 
so you could have life. He paid the price for your death. Now God's judgment was passed upon you righteously and Christ took that judgment for you. Do you understand what I'm saying? Anyone not understand it? I'll repeat it if you want me to. No one wants me to. You all understand what I said? Is anyone awake? Do you all understand what I said? Sure? Why do you understand? I'll say it once more. All right? When Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross, he lived a perfect life. Therefore, when he died, he took your sin and my sin into himself, and he paid the price and the penalty for your sin and my sin on Calvary's cross. That's why he was crucified. He didn't deserve to be. I did. You did. He died to it. And in dying to it, he bought an atonement. That means he made it possible for me once again to become one with God. He made it possible for me once again to have a relationship with God by taking my sin and your sin. Now, the gospel and the good news is that that's what Christ did. He was the Lamb of God that made the atonement. Therefore, as the light went out in Adam, so in Christ's obedience, it can be put on in me and in you. Do you understand? Now, the one ingredient necessary for that is repentance and confession of sin. In other words, I've got to confess that I'm a sinner. I've got to confess that I have no rights of my own, no goodness in me at all. Nothing good in me. And I've got to lay down my life that Christ might be all in all to me. Now that is the first part of the gospel. Now that's wonderful, isn't it, that Jesus died and atoned for our sin. But the second part, which brings balance to the cross, is the good news, that he rose again from the dead. Now, the proclamation of those two brings the cross in in a right balance. In other words, you don't get an unbalanced idea of the cross and get all mournful and religious and dowdy and hang crucifixes round your house um, with gruesome, grisly blood dripping everywhere and think you're being ever so religious and wear a crucifix around your neck. I hope none of you do, superstitious fat. Um, but it's, it's a realization that the cross is an, just an altar that God used. And that's it. It's finished with. Christ is not still hanging on a cross, is he? They took him down. They stuck him in a tomb, and he isn't in the tomb, is he? Hey? He's risen, isn't he? He's the lamb, as it were, slain from the foundation, but he's not slain, he's alive. So I must have know about the death, and then I must know about newness of life. I need the balance of both. And the brazen altar speaks, but I've got to come through the brazen altar before I can get on into God. So yes, I need to know all about repentance and the dealings of God and dealings with self. But if I stay there, I'll just be a miserable person, forever bemoaning my state. There's a resurrection too. Jesus came out of the tomb. Didn't he? And that speaks of resurrection life. And so I need in the gospel to hear both sides of it. So it wasn't just that he died, he rose again. And Paul writes that um, if he didn't rise, he said, our faith is vain. In Corinthians, you remember, in 2 Corinthians, he said, you know, we're without hope if he didn't rise. Of course he rose from the dead. And um, to set aside the death of Christ and speak only of his resurrection 
is a dangerous thing. That's what the charismatics do today. It's all done in Jesus. All done in Jesus. Don't worry. You don't need to repent. You don't need this. You don't need to do that. It's all been done for you. Well, that's a lie. You see, that's putting, that they call that putting the positive gospel. But you will know that if you, uh, any of you have ever played with electricity, that it's a thing that needs a positive and a negative. And when you connect the two with your fingers, you get an awful surprise. It's called an electric shock. Uh, quite shocking. Uh, because you've completed a circuit. And I do around my living room if I ever do it. Um, you know, it, it's not something that you want to practice. Uh, but in a light bulb, that's fine. It's made to light up. And you see, if you light, rather than being human, we're light bulbs. We need the positive and the negative in order to have the light of God. If you have more negative than positive, you've got a problem. If you have more positive than negative, you've got a problem. You need the balance. And that's why the staves were always put, and you'll notice everything that was carried had staves. Notice that. And they were of equal length. Because everything must have the balance of positive and negative. In God, he's arranged it that way. That's why everything has meaning. And um, we need to know the resurrection. And uh, if we come to the place where we just talk about his resurrection and set aside the death of Christ, it makes the resurrection life of no avail. Because, you see, you can't get into God and into the resurrection life but through his death. Therefore, if you always play down the death side and the dealing with self, no one's ever going to get it. There'll be thieves and robbers. They'll be trying to get in another way, won't they? But you've got to come by the door which speaks of death, of atonement, of shedding of blood, of death of self. To set that aside is wrong. But then to live forever at the door is a bit stupid. If you came round to my house to dinner, um, we've got a porch in our house and we open the front door to you, and said good evening and you just remained in the porch you wouldn't eat your dinner because we have it on the table not in the porch I mean who eats dinner in the porch? no one unless you live in Hawaii and then you <laughs> it's probably the coolest place but the thing is no one eats out on the porch in England it's too cold silly place to eat you have to come in now a lot of people live forever kind of you know at the cross and they're all miserable and sad. And, and therefore, you've got a swing over where people have tried to correct that, and they've gone, you know, oh, Jesus is risen, hallelujah, and they've tried to push the cross right out the way. Thank God for the cross. Let us always boast of the cross of Christ. Let us always remember the cross of Christ. Let us always see that it's a means to an end. It's an opening up of life. It's bringing me into the heavenly realm. It's opening up heaven to me. It's opening up the spirituals to me. It's not an end. It's a beginning. But every time I need to come by the beginning to get in. Do you all understand what I'm saying? So it's a glorious thing. Paul said, I want glory in, in anything save the cross of Christ. Our glory in Jesus Christ and him crucified. Do you understand that? It's a means to an end. Now I have a motor car and my car is very useful as long as it goes. And I seem to be able to buy cars that don't at some time or other. I think we all do, don't we? Anything mechanical in this world seems to go wrong. And a car is a great thing from getting the point A to point B. And that's what I use it for. I don't like cars. I hate them. I really do. Because 
I find that they're just something I couldn't dote on a car. I think people that do must be mental. You know, they call them names. I call mine names <laughs> when it goes wrong. I mean, you know, isn't it ridiculous? Especially women, they're stupid sentimental things. And they, they call cars names. I call mine names. But, I mean, you know, when it goes wrong, um, I call it a thing and a nuisance and a wretch and things. But it's, a, it's got a purpose, get to point A to point B. Now, you see, the altar and the cross of Christ has a purpose. Now, the purpose for the children of Israel was to deal with sin. But there was a way in to the court of the congregation beyond that. You see, they weren't ever intended only to remain at the brazen altar and go away. They were intended to come on in and have fellowship and find out how God was moving, what was happening, what God was saying to his people. They could inquire of the Lord. Even the leper, once he was cleansed, could go on in. But you see, so often... We only go just the entrance. So often we try and go beyond the entrance, but we won't go the right way. I don't know if you've ever played, you know, when I was a kiddie, we used to have these games where you had a maze and an end in the middle, and you had to kind of make a pencil line and get right to the center, and you'd come to dead ends every so often. Well, a lot of Christians, they're trying and they just want, there's a direct route in, straight through. But they're like fiddling around in a maze, trying to get round God, you know. Well, he won't notice this and he won't notice that, and I don't think he really bothers about this. And they're always trying to get round what God says. They're always trying to find a little way, another devious little route. They keep coming to a brick wall. See? It's called the fence of the congregation. You'll end up there. But you see, there's only one door. And you've just got to go in that way. And you make up your mind, either you're going to go this way or you won't get in. Now, there's no good me offering you the benefits of heaven if I don't tell you the cost. Now, the cost is everything. It's cheap, isn't it? You go to buy a car and the salesman says, well, you say to the salesman, how much is it going to cost you? And he says, everything. How many of you would stand by it? You think, well, goodness me, just for a rotten old piece of tin, I'm not paying that. I mean, they do rot, don't they? Uh, you wouldn't pay that. You'd think, not everything I own for that. Not lightly. Although some people are silly and do things like that. They'd give everything some people, evil natures they've got. Um, but you don't, you wouldn't give everything. And yet you see with Christ the cost is everything. You won't get it any cheaper. You cannot come to Christ with your conditions. You cannot come to Christ half-heartedly. You can't come to Christ and say, well I'll have so much and no more. I'll pay so much and no more. It's all or nothing. Now do understand, it's an all or nothing. I want to point out to you the, the lambs that were bought to make the atonement on the altar were without spot or blemish. Now if the chap walked in there and he showed the priest the lamb and he put his hand on its head and he confessed his sin to the priest, and the priest got a knife and he said, now just a minute, it's a lamb without spot or blemish. Look how beautiful it is. It's got a lovely woolly coat. Uh, and it's got a most beautiful bar to it. And, you know, it, it's delightful. It's pedigree. Look at its hooves. No, no problem with its hooves. It's beautiful, isn't it? Snow white. And, you know, he began to lead it on. Pass the altar, into the tabernacle. The priest would have kicked him out. He said, just a minute. He said, you know, you can't go in there with that. That's, that's got to die. You're not allowed in there. And so the chap says, well, just kind of 
What about taking off a pint of blood? I mean, you don't have to actually kill it, do you? Wouldn't a little bit do? I mean, what about just pricking its finger and taking a little bit? Uh, its hoof, rather. Prick its hoof. Take, let's take a little bit of blood. I mean, we don't... I mean, blood's blood, isn't it? I mean, if you've got uh, 10 pints of blood, or 11, I think you have, if you've got both arms full, or you, you have just, um, you know... One pint, I mean, it's still blood, isn't it? But the priest wouldn't accept that. No, the thing was the blood had to be shed, but the lamb had to die. And you see, with Jesus, the price is everything. You, yourself, your ego, your desires, everything that you want, your ministry, your idea of how good you are, has all got to go on the altar. Nothing of you is going to remain. Now, either you're going to pay that price and you can have life and go beyond the brazen altar or you just can't get in. Now, that might be the problem why some of you just can't get in. So, well, I, you know, I, I thought he'd be happy because um, God's given me this great ability to do such and such a thing and Therefore, you know, I want to be used of God. Well, he doesn't want to use you. He wants to kill you. He wants death. And that's that. And that's what it's going to cost. Now, if you want to be a Christian and you want to go God's way, that's the price. It's not very much, is it? Hmm? in comparison to what you get. I mean, instead of your wretched, miserable, perverted, twisted, distorted, disdainful, ugly life, you can have his. I mean, it's cheap, isn't it? Hmm? Well, isn't it? I mean, losing. I mean, you imagine me coming along to a tailor uh, with a dirty old crumpled suit with holes in the rear end and trousers all frayed and cuffs frayed and a jacket that's through the elbows and I said, oh, here you are, make me another suit and he makes it and I'll say, there you are, I'll give you this rotten old one as payment. What do you think the tailor would say? But I mean, that's how God is offering you a whole new, perfect, pure, holy exchange your rotten old stinking life. Oh, isn't that a good bargain? Isn't it? But you see, the trouble is, there's something comfortable about old things. That's why Jesus said about when men have drunk old wine, they say they don't like the new, they prefer the old. Do you remember the story? They say the old's better. You know, I have a wife, and uh, when I first got married, this was some time ago, I got married, I can't think, nine years, I think, is it? Yeah, nine years ago. Hmm. It's nearly past it. And um, I got married, and she had one habit that I couldn't tolerate. She had this pair of shoes that were comfortable. And they were so comfortable, she kept wearing them. And they were old. And when I say old, I mean old. They look awful. And I said, why don't you throw those shoes away? And she said, but lovey, they're comfortable. Now at the time I was earning, I suppose it was nine years ago, about ten, twelve thousand 12,000 a year, which wasn't a bad salary. And... Um, you know, my wife would still go out in these old shoes. And I came home one day, and there she was sitting in quite embarrassed. The next door neighbor had given her a new pair of shoes. <laughs> Thought we couldn't afford it. See, there was 
something about those old shoes. I mean, I hated them. I wanted to jump on them or burn them. But they're kind of comfortable. They fit so well. And you see, our lives, when Jesus has cleaned them up a little bit, you know, our nice kind of exterior, it kind of fit. It's so comfortable. It's nice to feel proud of your achievements to God. I mean, you know, I did this for Jesus, did that for Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, do so and so for Jesus. I want to serve him. And, and it has a kind of nice feel to it called ego. 